Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Steve Gregorian. I'm the president and CEO of the Detroit Economic Club, and I want to welcome you to today's special and important meeting. I especially want to welcome our members and encourage those of you who are not members to become one. As we get started, I would just ask you to kindly silence your cell phone so we do not disturb the program. And as you all know, one of the great traditions of the DEC is we always begin by honoring our country with the Pledge of Allegiance. So I would ask you to stand and join me. The flag is to my right. And kindly remain standing as our invocation today will be delivered by Reverend Glenn McIntosh from Renaissance Unity in Ferndale. If we could just collectively gather our minds, our hearts, and our spirit, and just put everything in your mind on vibrate. And as we move into this critical conversation about the opioid epidemic, remember that Albert Einstein said you can't solve a problem with the mind you use to create it. And so, again, we bow our heads and pray. Almighty Spirit of the universe, we feel your presence in this place. We welcome you. Because of your divine presence, we suspend all disbelief and know that all things are possible. We ask that you give us a mind that is open to everything and closed to nothing that prevents us from elevating our thoughts, our feelings, and behaviors to a higher level of consciousness. Almighty Spirit, give us the capacity, the vision, unlimited possibilities, and light a pathway for us to follow in the best of times and in the worst of times. And on that pathway, Almighty Spirit, entrust us as leaders to use the four elements of creation, earth, wind, fire, and water, to advance ourselves, our families, our organizations, our city, our region, our state, and our nation into a place of peace, a place of caring, a place of sharing, and a place of prosperity that exceeds our intellectual capacity to comprehend or explain. Almighty Spirit, pour out blessings to all of us in this room with a special blessing to Chris Swiss and Detroit Economic Club. Collectively, we say amen. Thank you, Reverend McIntosh. A quick but important thank you to Detroit Public Television, Lawrence Technological University for live streaming today's program. Compliments of the Hartford Company, we thank you as well for participating in that. We love having our high school and college students with us, as you know. Today was no exception. They got to spend a student reception about 30 minutes with Chris Swift today, and we had a terrific uh, Q&A session. I want to take a minute just to let you know who's here and who sponsored them. I would just ask you to hold your applause, please. Uh, we've got students today from Central Academy, thanks to uh, Kaylee General and General Motors Company. Two groups from Melvindale High, High School. Thank you, Kathy Weaver from Aon, and also St. Joseph Mercy Health System. Wayne County Community College District. Thank you, Linda, and the great folks at Highland. University of Liggett High School, thank you to Larry Burns and Children's Hospital of Michigan Foundation. Schoolcraft College, thanks to Priority Health. And it's always a great day when I'm not the only Armenian in the room. We've got 20 students from AGBU Manoogian School, partially brought to you by Grand Valley State University and Liz Russell, and also SMG and Claude Molinari and the rest of the great FSMG folks. So how about a round of applause for our students and their sponsors? couple things quickly on your table. One is our season lineup. We've got uh, a busy month of March that continues. And I know you're all grumpy about the winter like I am. So we're going to give you a chance next Thursday at Detroit Axe in Ferndale to do some networking, but also get your aggression out by throwing axes at Detroit Axe. So we hope you can be with us then. It's a late afternoon, early evening things. I just hope you won't throw axes at the other DEC members. So thank you for that. March 26th, we've got a sold out 
uh, event with Stuart Hoffman, the chief economist at PNC Bank. If you're interested in that, you can call the office. We'll get you on a waiting list. And then finally, we're thrilled to have Jeffrey Seller, the Hamilton producer, with us the next day, March 27th. He is an Oak Park, Michigan native and a U of M alum, and uh, the Hamilton producer, of course. So we look forward to seeing you at these events when your schedule permits. Also on your table, we would not be here today if it wasn't for these generous corporate sponsors. I ask you to take a look at this, patronize these people. If you're one of these corporate sponsors, we say thank you. If you're interested in becoming a corporate sponsor, there's terrific benefits, and I'd love to talk you through that. If you're a tweeter, we want you to tweet today using at Debt Economic Club. And Chris Swift, the DEC has an incredible history of speakers that we would love to share with you. March 7th is a very popular date in our history. You, sir, now join a distinguished list of 15 other speakers who have graced our podium on this day. A couple of highlights. 1941, Air Marshal William Bishop was a Canadian World War I flying ace here talking to us about the war in the air for World War II. 1966, Willard Rockwell, the chairman of the Rockwell Corporation, 1988, Austin Kiplinger from the Kiplinger Letter. And today, we're pleased to add you, sir, as our 16th speaker on this day in DEC history. So congratulations, and thank you. Thank you. And one of the more popular elements of our meetings is we want you guys to have a chance to submit some questions. So at the end of the session today, the final 15 minutes, Chris has agreed to ask, answer even your toughest questions. Uh, there's instructions on your table. You can do that via your smartphone. And those questions will make their way to our presiding officer, who I'm about to put to work. Hans Werner Koss is senior partner at McKinsey & Company. He is a DEC board member and a great friend of the DEC and a great supporter of many things in our community. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hans Werner Koss. Thank you, Steve, and welcome, good afternoon, to all DEC members and our distinguished guests. It is my privilege today to introduce today's participants. Let me begin first by starting with a gentleman on your left. Chris Swift, he is chairman and the CEO of the Hartford, well-known, 207-year-old national leader in property casualty insurance, group benefits and mutual funds, and as Chris also mentioned it, a 207 years old startup. I heard that comment a little bit earlier today. A startup which has been quite a long time around it speaks for its own success. Chris joined the Hartford in March 2010 as executive vice president and chief financial officer. And previously, he held various senior leadership and finance roles at American International Group and began his career as a CPA at KPMG. Chris is also an active member of the community, including on the board of directors of the American Insurance Association. He earned a bachelor's degree in accounting from Marquette University, where he's also a trustee. Welcome, Chris. <laughs> and our moderator today is Dr. Diana Leitz, very well known, not only in the closer area of Detroit, I'm sure also beyond, an award-winning health reporter at WWJ News Radio 950. Previously, Diana was the medical reporter for major TV news stations in Miami, Chicago, Boston. And she has received multiple awards for her reporting, including six Emmy Award nominations, a Michigan Association of Broadcast Award, and two American Heart Association Awards. Diana holds a Bachelor of Science degree in nutrition from Michigan State University and earned a doctor degree in podiatric medicine degree from the Dr. Williams Shaw College of Podiatric Medicine in Chicago. Diana completed her podiatric surgical residency at the Phoenix Community Hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Detroit Economic Cup welcome to Chris and Deanna. Welcome. So, so Deanna, you start with the warm-up questions, the easy ones. I have a few from the audience. Okay, the and then ones. we'll take the hard ones. But uh, we'll come to that. Please take it away. Thank you. Okay. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm thrilled to be here. And I want to welcome you, Chris, to Detroit and the Detroit Economic Club. It's great to be here. Have you been to Michigan before? A couple times. No, I've, I've been, I grew up in Chicago, so this is like a next door neighbor. Uh, so, but it's nice to be back and uh, see all the great things the city is doing. Okay, well, we have a very timely and serious topic to talk about today, the economics of a health crisis, how business must lead in the battle against opioids. And um, I would venture to say that just about everyone in this room has either been personally affected or knows someone that's been affected by the opioid crisis. I looked up some statistics before I came here today. And according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, in 2017, more than 70,000 Americans died from drug overdoses. Of those, more than 47,000 died because of an opioid overdose. That's about 130 Americans dying every day from an opioid overdose. And those numbers are expected to continue to increase if we don't get a handle on this. So I was very interested to take part in today's uh, discussion. And they told me I'd be interviewing the chairman and CEO of the Hartford. And the first thing I wondered was, he must have a lot of business topics that he could talk about, I wondered why he decided to tackle the opioid epidemic. So let's start with that, Chris. What made you want to take on this topic? Sure. Well, it, as, as it was said in the opening, the Hartford's, uh, I round up, a 210-year-old you know, company that specializes in disability and workers' compensation insurance. And we've seen firsthand sort of the, the toll that it's opioid addiction and abuse has taken on individuals, families, uh, communities, and businesses, and you know, felt you know, the, the need to you know, speak out about it. We consider our mission sort of underwriting human achievement by providing insurance to people that want to transfer risk to us so that they can pursue their dreams, their passions, and have that insurance respond or prevail when, when, when it's needed. So anything that we see complicates that, that mission, you know, we're gonna you know, speak out about it. And I, th I think the simple fact, and everyone would probably acknowledge this, I mean, this opioid crisis didn't develop over the last couple of years. I mean, it's de de been developing over a decade. And for over a decade, we've been instituting on a continuous improvement basis our addiction strategies in our workers' comp and, and disability businesses where we focused on building uh, medical networks backed by doctors that are thoughtful prescribers of uh, prescriptions. We have you know, clinical nurses on staff that you know, really challenge uh, the appropriateness of, of medical scripts and the necessity of, of those uh, prescriptions. Um, our medical nurses also um, provide education to doctors and individuals or claimants on uh, you know, habits and, and duration use of, of, of these medicines. So, and then lastly, we've invested you know, heavily in data and analytics to be more predictive uh, about the conditions that people might develop in an addiction. So you, you put it all together and it is a real problem, uh, we feel. Uh, privileged and honored to at least you know put it up on a, on a mantle. You gave some you know statistics on a, a, abuse. I'll, I'll give a, you know a couple of our own. Um, you know, one third of Americans have been prescribed an opioid in 2017. Research shows that you have a one in five chance if you take an opioid for greater than seven to ten days to develop a, a, a habit, a real problem habit. Um, one of the statistics that our uh, analytics and data has produced is we've reduced opioid use in our workers' compensation and long-term di you know, disability book of business by 43% over a five-year period of time. So we can, we can implement you know, change. We have you know, capabilities to, to make an impact, but uh, the reason why I'm here is to, to elevate this issue because it is a, a is it a national crisis? 
And when we, usually when a spotlight is shined, um, there's a story in the media, it usually shows a family that's been devastated, destroyed by opioid misuse and abuse. But a lot of times we don't see about what's going on in the workforce. And do you think that some business leaders are maybe just not aware or they don't realize? Well, you know, for, first I would, what I'd say is you know, that this is more of than just a health issue. I mean, it, it is a business economic issue. No, no doubt that there's health components, but um, so that's that's the first you know, observation. And I think for fairly long, it, it just hasn't been talked about. Uh, you don't you know, really understand what's going on at, at, the, at the ground level. And I would say from, and I'll give you some examples from my personal experience, that people just aren't comfortable talking about addiction. Uh, as a disease or as an illness that needs you know, treatment. So you know, through you know, writing op-eds and, and taking public positions like you know, we have here, we've actually encouraged our, our people to you know, talk about it. Uh, we celebrate you know, National um, over, uh, Drug Overdose Day uh, as a means to say there is something you know, here that we could talk about. We could see in our Inter internet internally, you know, people you know, communicating and empathizing with one another, picking up that it's it's a you know, wider you know, spread issue. So, um, I, I think ultimately, you know, business leaders really need to, to understand uh, that there is probably going a lot on with their employees and or family members that affects the you know the business environment more than anything. I had an opportunity looking at. Uh, Aaron Ridge, who came with me from the, the Hartford, who is in our HR department. She organized uh, earlier this week for me to sit down with three women that experienced um, the devastation of addiction per personally. Uh, two of them lost a brother or a brother-in-law. One woman lost three brothers and a nephew. I mean, there are stories of the toll, though, not only personally on them, but on the family. Um, the, the one woman uh, described her uh, younger brother as a hockey player in high school and college and would get dinged up in the hockey games, right? It's a rough sport. Um, somehow, either through a script or the black market, he was told to take you know, this pill to, to help pain uh, to, him, to allow him to continue to perform at, at a high level. One thing led to another. Uh, he stole from every neighbor in his neighborhood to uh, fuel his addiction. Um, the family was shamed into, um, you know, what was happening to uh, you know, to their, their son, uh, and ultimately, you know, overdosed. Very similar story with the, the other woman, brother-in-law, uh, small business owner, a landscape company, got injured on on work, uh, took opioids too long. Uh, eventually, he developed a, a severe, severe addiction that this impacted his elderly mother at 80, who took out a, a reverse mortgage to finance her son's habits. Went through that, uh, obviously started borrowing from you know, other family members, and ultimately, he died of, of an overdose, but uh, the sister-in-law wasn't sure if it was an accident or if it was intentional. Two months later, his baby daughter was born. And then the third woman, losing three brothers, all in the you know, greater Hartford area to, to addiction, and then having it skip a generation to uh, her nephew, it's absolutely devastating. And stories like that, that really make us want to do more. And uh, ultimately, that's why we're here. I saw another statistic as far as... Um money with businesses that the, in 2017, the Council of Economic Advisors released a report estimating that the economic cost of the opioid crisis was $504 billion with lost productivity costing $20 billion. Why is this costing American businesses so much? Well, I think the first context on, on, on that point is, you know, really the human toll. I just gave you, you know, three examples, but it's, it's happening countlessly across America. I mean, the, the human toll uh, on in individuals, families, communities, 
on businesses. Uh, and the toll on businesses, you all know, I mean, it's higher medical cost, it's lower productivity, it's higher absenteeism, it's higher retraining and hiring costs. It all adds up. In an economy of our size, roughly 20 trillion, it's not surprising that it, it costs you know, $500 billion a year in economic you know, output. So the real point on, on all the, that, that statistics is that it's a, it's a widespread issue that requires bold thinking, as the, the Reverend said, new ideas, new solutions, and really, my words I always say is a multidisciplinary approach to, to really a complex problem. I think the other statistics, if, if you don't mind, um, you know, we've partnered with a, a group uh, called Shatterproof, uh, which is a non-for-profit organization, actually based in Connecticut also, that is doing great work on the prevention, uh, excuse me, on the recovery side. Mm -hmm. And we partner with them uh, and have some of their economic models on our website. So if you were a small business owner here in Michigan, you could go to our website, uh, type in sort of the nature of your business and how many employees you have, and it would give you the output of an estimated cost of the epidemic. And I'll give you two examples. If you're a restaurant owner that uh, owns uh, a restaurant, one location, 25 employees, I was at a great one last night, by the way. Uh, Selden, Selden Standard. Selden Standard, it was great. Anyways, it looks like they have about 25 employees here in Michigan. Their cost would be about $10,000 due to addiction. Again, absenteeism, higher, higher uh, medical, um, uh, lower productivity, and ultimately replacement cost if a uh, person you know, couldn't get help. If you're a manufacturer here in Michigan with 500 employees, your, your estimated cost would be $170,000 annually for the same you know, factors. So it is both a human issue and an economic issue, and that's why we all need to come together. You mentioned a couple things. What else is the Hartford doing to fight this epidemic? I would say we're doing three main themes, uh, and we have a lot of help, a lot of you know, great teammates that uh, are equally as passionate of this internally. So uh, the three you know, broad categories are, is one, cultural change, two would be education, and three, sort of action. And I'll explain each of, of the three a little bit more. So on the cultural change side, that, that centers around the stigma of addiction and the willingness and the openness of, of people to begin to talk about it. I've said, you know, we've, we've made it, a, we, we've given our employees a platform to, you know, to talk about it, but I think a lot of businesses uh, it could, could think about improving that, that dialogue, that connectivity, that discussion in, in this area, uh, because it's just not in a person's nature to talk about you know, something that's uh, uh, not going well. I think on the education side, um, it is ultimately about trying to empower each of us as individuals that is better prepared to understand the powerful effect of opioids and uh, subscription and how long you really should, should take these, these powerful nar narcotics. So there's a lot of things uh, around you know, education, including education of, of, of doctors you know, we're advocating for, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, how do we better educate uh, all, all people? So as I mentioned, Shatterproof. Uh, Shatterproof also you know, has 12 questions uh, out on their website that you could uh, uh, look up that says, you know, what are in essence the 10 questions, 12 questions I need to ask before I start taking uh, this powerful narcotic. Also there's signs, you know, there's, they have a section in there where <clears throat> you can actually see signs of addiction. So again, there's, I think there's educational materials out there that we'll continue to advocate for. And in the last area of, of action, I'll give you two, two examples. Um, action is really, uh, I think, focused on the policy side. You have getting you have various policymakers, both at the federal and state level, to understand the, the nature of the issue and ultimately advocating for policy change that really limits the dosage and duration of these subscriptions. No one needs a 30-day supply of, of opioids. Um, 
and ultimately, you know, to, to work on what is the solutions or what are the alternative uh, pain relief, you know, mechanisms. And then I would say, you know, the other, you know, example I would give you is about, um, it's estimated 6 million, you know, people have a addiction in the United States. And some of that addiction is actually fueled by the home medicine cabinet. So if, if an addict is invited over to your house, he or she will likely be going through your medicine cabinet. And if you're like many of us, I mean, you have uh, many scripts in, uh, in your home you know, cabinet that you know, probably are going unused, unneeded. And working with you know, our um, uh, drug enforcement agency and sort of their take back medicine day, um, there's actually bags, chemical, uh, chemical bags that you could put uh, your unused scripts into, put a glass of water, and safely dispose of it. So when you leave here today, we're going to give you your home take-back medicine you know, kit so that you can dispose of it. I did it at, at home. I shouldn't say that. I brought the bags home for my wife. Uh, and she went through the cabinets, and we found 60 pills that needed to be disposed of. 60. Right? You, you have a wisdom tooth out. You have a... I had an appendix out, and all of a sudden you, you didn't realize what you accumulated because you just put it up on your back of your shelf. An addict would find that. If they have an addict in your home, they would find that. So those are some of the things that uh, you know, we're, we're doing. And obviously when we're talking about sometimes people are overprescribed drugs, like one of the first places that a teenager will get opioids is when they get their wisdom tooth out. They're getting too many. What do you think needs to be done either through the medical profession or the government to sort of help fix this problem? You know, it's a, um, it's a challenging, you know, issue, right? And I think like anything, it, 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 maybe it's a, it's a habit. I, I don't know. Maybe it's a habit for the doctors you know, just to, to write scripts. Maybe it's a habit uh, that primary care doctors or um, you know, the dentists are seeing 20 to 30 patients a day and they don't have time, you know, to, to really explore. So I, I don't think there is, is one thing. I think it's a, a combination of activities that need to be focused on that have created the problem and sort of reverse engineer what, what really needs to stop or what really needs to change. Um, so I, I think that's the, the, the simplest answer I could give right now, Deanna. And a lot of um, your employees seem to have a say in this um, crisis, so that must be helpful. Have they always been on board trying to learn more and, and be a part of this process? Yeah, we, we have a, a wonderful group of uh, 19,000 employees that are really committed to giving back to the community. It's, it's an important part of our, our culture as far as some of our sustainability you know, mm -hmm. concepts, both from the environment, both from giving back to our local community, and both for then you know, supporting diversity and inclusion. So it's natural for our people to, 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 to give in this area. And I, I would tell you, it's uh, across the board fully supportive. And they're proud of you know, what we're doing. We're proud we're taking a stand. The three women I, I met with uh, on Monday for lunch uh, all sent me notes uh, basically saying just how proud that, that they were to work for an organization that was um, you know, giving a platform for this. So um, yeah, it is, it is very gratifying. And, keeps us going. And it probably helps reduce that stigma that you were talking about by having conversation in your place of business. No, no, no doubt about it. People are, are comfortable. How about, though, obviously people are always going to have pain, whether acute pain or chronic pain. And I know you're not saying that they shouldn't ever take medication. What are your thoughts about managing pain? You guys realize I'm a, an accounting finance guy, not a medical profession. <laughs> <laughs> but I've done a little research. Um, I, I, I'll tell you how, how we think about it, you know, in, internally in our business, and then um, I think it could be applicable to other aspects of our economy. So, again, in conjunction with, with Shatterproof, we, we, we want responsible uh, use of, of op opioids. We're not here advocating for the take them off the shelves and, mm -hmm. and saying that they have no... Um, you know, uh, medical purpose in society. 
again, researching the, these drugs, they were developed in the late 70s, early 80s for end-of-life treatment to comfort those that had it, basically a terminal illness. Somehow they morphed into, you know, if you get two wisdom teeth out, you know, take you know, a 10-day script. That's not their intended use. So, you know, you know first is we always want to make sure that you, know, you have alignment on what doctors are prescribing based on the nature of, of the pain. Um, so again, with our nurses internally, and particularly in our workers' comp you know, business and, and our long-term disability, we will continue to question the use of widespread use of uh, opioids for an extended period of time. If there are alternatives, treatments mm -hmm. out there, that, that makes sense. But if you're really dealing with chronic pain, there's usually a, a root cause of the chronic pain that you have to get at as, as opposed to just prescribing a pill. And what we've adapted in our uh, claims practices is more of a holistic medicine approach where we'll have wellness coaches you know, focused in on biological, psychological, and social aspects of what a claimant might be dealing with if they're not getting better, if they're been on uh, opioids you know, too long. So that holistic you know, medicine, I, I think, is much better than just you know, taking a script for a short period of time to deal with chronic pain. So what do you think uh, business leaders, whether it's a large company or small company, can do to take a first step towards battling this? Well. You all are in, in the business world, uh, whether you own your own businesses or, or work for the, a larger organization or a school or a, a community. Um, I, I would ask you to you know, think about some of the things we just talked about. One, uh, the cultural side of reducing the stigma of, of addiction. I think you, you, you can allow that to be uh, talked about. You, you, there's ways of promoting subtly in, in communications you know, that these things are okay to, you know, to talk about. And, uh, encourage people to find the right support um, mechanisms. I'd say, again, the educational side, you could contribute, again, by uh, arming your employees or, or coworkers with you know, knowledge about um, you know, these medicines and how you could take a little bit more ownership in what you, you put into your body. Um, I think that the third thing that I would really ask you to consider, and, and I, we're looking at it right now, is just in your, if you have employee assistant programs, EAPs, if you do, great. If you don't, I think, I think you really need to seriously consider adding an EAP program for addiction and mental health. Mental health's not a topic today. I'm not an expert on it. <clears throat> I've just seen, again, firsthand some issues that uh, this next generation and a lot of people are dealing with mental health issues regarding depression and anxiety that numerous counts that uh, are elevated. So that those EAP programs obviously can provide assistance either through telemedicine, through time off to, to go into recovery. But I, I think if, if we could look at benefits differently and say what resources can we contribute to the problems from a benefit side that we're willing to spend to have productive workers, to have happy workers, talents that usually the biggest part of any organization. If you don't have a talented workforce that is committed and productive, I don't think you could win in a competitive society today. So it's both personal, it's business, um, it's education, it's letting the issue you know, come to light. It's not buried anymore. No, that's, how have other, you're one of the first uh, business leaders to come out and, and speak on this topic. How are other um, business leaders are they receptive? Are they surprised that, are they, were they not thinking about it so much within their business organizations? I, I think in, in general, you know, people have a, a working knowledge of, of the issue. I, I, I would just say that I think to understand holistically the impact on some of the data and statistics, uh, I, think, I think that's, there's a ways to go there. So again, I, I encourage you know, business leaders, and again, it's probably your philosophy too, Unless you really measure something and know where you stand today, there's no way to improve it from whatever trend you want to change. So whether you're a large business, a small business, you know, there, there's, there are ways of partnering with people, like your workers' comp provider or your long-term care provider or your 
pharmacy benefit provider of actually getting data and knowledge about what's happening you know, with your em employees today. Um, and then obviously committing to a course to, to change whatever path that you are on, uh, or if it's acceptable, that's great. But generally, there's always room for improvement in understanding what is currently you know, happening with the employee base today, and then you know, instructing your, your, your partners to really produce a different outcome. If you tell your, your and we work with Optum. Optum's got great data and analytics. They really do. And they know we're focused on reducing, uh, for our employees, the number of scripts that uh, physicians write for uh, an, old, an opioid. They're coming down. They're coming down. Do you think most businesses have a first aid kit and some have the external defibrillators? Do you think Narcan should be um, now a part of a uh, first aid kit? It's And for those that don't know, it can re um, reverse an opioid overdose. It's a nasal spray, and you can get it over the counter without a prescription. Yeah, I mean, there's been you know a lot talked about this. You've probably seen the 60 Minutes uh, report that you know uh, really documented how effective you mm -hmm. know that could be in, in the situations. You know, it's a little beyond my pay grade. You know, honestly, I, I don't know what the, the the local requirements are or laws. Um, Part of me says that there are some requirements to have you know, first aid kits at, at work, uh, defibrillators. So, but to take that then to you know, having a, a pen seems logical. Um, I, would, I would, again, want to do it as a, as a leader of our organization if I really understand the, the numbers and the addiction you know, that we have in our employee base today uh, or figure out another way you know, to, to get them um, you know, a, a, some some form of medical relief if if they have a loved one that became unaddicted you know or became addicted and had a shock to have something hanging on a wall on an office wall doesn't seem all that uh, uh, practical to me for you know the real problem but okay. that's just me we just have about a minute left is there anything else that you want to um, give a take-home message that people can think about when they leave here well, I, I would say, because I have to give a shout out, given I'm here in Michigan, is that your governor, uh, legislature, and your police department have been very proactive in this area and, and passing legislation that deals with providing stricter oversights into uh, subscriptions, uh, providing resources uh, to the medical community and to those being affected by addiction. Um, the state police department that's uh, represented here today has opened up their facilities for uh, addicts you know, that need care. So there are things being done uh, at the federal and state and, and national levels that are, are contributing to that. It's just more that needs to be done. So don't think about education, think about reducing the shame, uh, and thinking about the, the proaction and the proactive things that you could do in your place of employment to contribute to this overall problem. OK, thanks Thank you so, so much. much. Now we will continue with a round of questions from all of you. First of all, a question, and you briefly alluded to it, Chris. You spoke about that multidisciplinary approach. In, in fact, the last 60 seconds of your I sounded like a McKinsey guy, didn't I? Yeah, almost. Yeah, no, absolutely. Much better, by the way. Much, much better. Do we need a different central institution to coordinate such a multidisciplinary approach is one of the questions we receive on the federal level, state level, private sector, which you represent. Who should coordinate so that, A, we become more effective, and B, given also the statistics which Deanna outlined, we are much faster in our response to prevent and treat the issue. I think it's a valid point. Um, if I didn't explain it well enough, our, our partner Shatterproof is actually taking that on from, from a treatment side. We're primarily focused on you know, the prevention side of a lot of our activities and questioning use, but uh, the addiction side, they, they have made great progress. And I give a shout out to Gary Mandel, their, their CEO, where you know, they are working on universal standard of care for addiction. 
and developing sort of what they would call the, the first principles of care for substance abuse. And really what they've done is it's a complex issue because money comes from the federal government vis-a-vis -vis Medicaid, Medicare. But a lot of the, the pharmaceutical issues are controlled at the state level. The state you know, levels uh, you know, generally control, obviously, the doctor licensing uh, and, and programs. So there isn't one overarching body yeah. that you know, sort of can say, my words, grace, on these things. But through his efforts, he's put the right people at table, at the right people at the table, in a really a mission-driven outcome focus base to say, okay, what do we need to do? Because a lot of what we do today doesn't make sense. So he's had the right eight or 10 people around the table in, in most of these states you know, for, for a dialogue. So that's why we're gonna continue to part, partner with him and support him on the, uh, on, on, the, on the treatment side. Exactly, and also nationally replicate the model which he has been starting in, in Connecticut. Another question addresses a very specific opioid bill package which was passed in the legislature season 2017-2018, and I, I will keep it a bit shorter in the summary description. It was indeed restricting the use of opioids to the public, which at first sight you might argue, that's good. But it also opens doors to search for illegal drugs, and that is actually a side issue which has grown substantially over the last few months and, and actually years. Any thoughts on that, how we find the balance between a more responsible usage of opioids as a prescription, which we talked about, but also avoiding opening doors to illegal drug usage? Yeah, I think the legislation, I'll, I'll take the legislation you know, first, is the last Congress did pass legislation that you know, really uh, reform certain aspects of Medicaid, Medicare you know, related to the financial resources mm -hmm. and how it's, how it's used there. They also, again, did provide more resources to um, medical providers, a uh, little higher requirements and standards on uh, monitoring, and then they also gave additional resources to, to those that are, are addicted. So good first step. Now what Congress needs to do, uh, primarily through, I think, the Energy and Commerce Committee is implement that. Implement. So they've, they've, they've passed the standards, but now the hard work of actually implementing is, is still ahead. So um, we encourage them to, to get with the, in, into the implementation, the rules, the regulations that they're gonna pass from there, and mm -hmm. uh, we're ready to you know, support any other action that you know, the Congress you know, wants to be done. Now, now you're, you're, you got into the other aspect of what a lot of states have done up front is to, to limit scripts for opioids no greater than 10 days. Mm -hmm. So about 26 states have, have done that, which is a good, good first step. 13 additional states have gone as far as to say, we're gonna also d develop a formula, view it as like a chart, that if you have this condition, this injury, this is the medicine you get. And it's mm -hmm. usually not an opioid. So we call that formularies. So 13 states have actually done that. So then you get into the illegal side of you know, manufacturing, black market. Mm -hmm. um, I'm out of my league here. I, I met, I think, uh, a U.S. Attorney General here in, in, in Detroit that's been prosecuting and um, you know, trying to stop that you know, illicit activity. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the connection can be or is, if there is a connection, but we shouldn't be afraid to limit the legal dosage and duration uh, and we'll, we, we can have another fight, another battle on the illegal side. Yeah, we need to fight both, both yeah, sides. We do. Agree. Thank you. You briefly also mentioned the importance of, in the world we are living in, of big data analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms. The last two years, if you reflect what you did at the Hartford, did that really bring substantially new insights, which you translated, I think, in your three pillar program, culture, education, and action? Yes, I mean, the data and analytics that we, and, and the algorithms and the machine learning that we're doing on our larger data sets over the last five years has contributed to that 43% decline in our opioid use in, in our claim activities. So we have our head of claims, John Kinney, with us. He gets all the credit. Uh, I take a little credit because we gave him $100 million to invest mm -hmm. in a new machine uh, to produce these results. So uh, it was a good partnership. Great enabling, thank you. Obviously, healthcare professionals are at, 
at the center uh, of the opioid crisis, and you spoke about education. And, and there is also an inherent, sometimes a conflict with pharmaceutical companies who design, manufacture opioids. And if they are publicly held companies, they are committed to create shareholder value and also maximize profits and, and monetary value. What is the ethical balance we need to strike between pharmaceutical companies who are indeed operating at that line of profit maximization, at the same time doctors who know the patient, who know the individual patient and need to make responsible calls? Now that's a difficult one. Is that you, you, I want to be constructive and helpful for mm -hmm. what we need to change going forward and, and not point any fingers really in the past. So uh, we are where we are. All, all I really believe in my heart is you know, we need to, to, to change the habits of writing automatic scripts. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a misalignment in, in the incentives, uh, we should look at that. And I would say in this particular area, I, I might even change the equation from a shareholder-driven model to what's good for the country, what's good for our local communities, mm -hmm. and in turn, I think that'll be good for our businesses in this area. Mm -hmm. um, because I said, or Deanna said, if there's $500 billion of waste created by a misallocation of you know, these types of uh, narcotics. Yeah, and it talks to the responsibility of private sector companies also as key entities in a society. It, it's not only about the shareholder value creation, it is about societal responsibility, for which your company, the Hartford, has been a great role model. The, the next question is much more around a personal one, um, Chris, and actually it got the highest number of, actually, uh, call it feedback here from the audience. When you reflect back, even beyond the last five years, was there a particular moment, a special moment for yourself that you realize the depth of the issue, the depth and breadth of the issue? You know, we've, um, we've had family members you know, deal with uh, addiction. Mm -hmm. We've had uh, family members deal with uh, mental illness. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say there was an exact trigger, but you know, we've, we've been personally exposed to um, you know, some difficult issues. So I think then when the, the data, uh, and when we really got into our, our data more specifically, it's just how, how much abuse was really happening. When people were on scripts you know, for months and months and years in some cases and aren't getting better, uh, again, John Kinney really opened my eyes into what was happening in our own data set with our own claimants and we had basically said we got to do something about it. Thank you. Now, a, a final question. When we move a little bit beyond the business, we, we look at each other ourselves. What advice would you have for each of us? What, what should we do in terms of helping, quote unquote, address that crisis here on a national level? Well, you, one, you never know where, where it's going to happen, right? I mean, we've talked a little bit in, in preparation. So it could be a, a colleague, it could be a friend, it could be a family member that really needs your support and help. Um, mm -hmm. So if you have a little higher uh, awareness, uh, more awareness, um, empathy, I think you could do you know, great things uh, as far as uh, physical support, um, financial support, treatment support. Um, we have other programs um, you know, that have patterns and in conditions where others could get involved. I think of particularly Al-Anon Al and some of the uh, alcohol treatment programs. So, but I would, I would say this is uh, just as widespread, if not more, the addiction problem in the US. So uh, I think awareness and empathy are, are probably two big things you could take away today. Good, thank you, very good advice. Thank you, Chris, for answering our questions. Thank you to Deanna again. And now we switch gears lightly to a, a bit more personal questions, and it is a lightning round, so don't lightning think round. too much. Um, <laughs> short questions, something. short <laughs> answers, very spontaneous. <laughs> There's not a lot of science behind it. Uh, first of all, um, anything left on your bucket list? What do you do? My bucket list, personal yeah. one? I, I've traveled quite a bit, but I haven't been to Australia and New Zealand, so my wife and I are gonna make a trip there. Good, thank you. 
And any person other than your family members or best friends you would like to have lunch with? Other than coming back to the Detroit Economic mm -hmm. Club? Or? Yeah, all my friends here. <laughs> no, if I had to pick one, it's it just uh, Bill Gates. He's uh, just, just a wonderful uh, humanitarian now, but a mm -hmm. uh, great entrepreneur. And, uh, I, 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 I would enjoy having, uh, and his wife, uh, Melinda, of we course. We'll see what we can do. And okay. We'll work on that. Um, well, one of your favorite songs, you don't have to sing, just mention. Oh, mention. Yeah, I, I can't <laughs> sing. I, uh, I enjoy U2 and the Beatles probably the most. Oh. So U2 would be Beautiful Day and the Beatles would be Come Together. It's a good theme also related to the mm -hmm. conversation we had over the last 60 minutes here. Um, favorite uh, team, sports team growing up, which I can't your... say that. I'm in Detroit. <laughs> I know that's a little bit of a politically loaded question here, but uh, well, I grew be, up honest, in Chicago. be honest. No, I, I grew up in Chicago, and so I, uh, my, my dad's side of the family was Cubs fans. My mother's side of the family was White Sox fans, so I've had years of counseling to resolve my conflict, <laughs> and I am a Cubs fan. Good. Good. We'll, we'll not look at uh, how the next season is going to shape up. We'll see. Uh, your best sport, your favorite sport? Golf. Golf, very clear. Last book you read? Uh, I finished, finally. Uh, Peggy Noonan's book, um, Time of Our Lives, which was a collection of her essays and writings over the years, going back you know, 20 years. And maybe like most of you, we read her every weekend in, in the Wall Street Journal. I think she's just got a wonderful mm -hmm. intuitive feel and a touch to what's going on in, in the broader America. I like some of our stories from the old days, so that was, uh, that was an enjoyable read. Uh, then, uh, favorite vacation spot other than uh, Australia and New Zealand, which is on the bucket list? Munich, Germany. Thank you, that's great. <laughs> no, not from Munich, I'm from Frankfurt, but love to hear it. It's also my, it's also my, my favorite city in Germany, Munich. Close to the Alps, great skiing, a lot of great things. Um, describe Detroit in one or two words. I know we're close to it, but I, uh, I why don't you just say Renaissance? Um, your city's being reborn, uh, reinvigorated. It's, uh, the energy is really palatable here, so it is uh, just great to see a history with, uh, a city with so much history uh, being reborn and uh, being positioned for success for the next 100 years. So uh, well done to all the community leaders and uh, all the people that, that contribute to make that happen. Thank you, thank you. Last question. Advice to your 25-year-old self. You know, people in our age, we get those questions. So yeah. <laughs> what advice would you give to yourself when you were 25? I would say uh, be confident in your own skin and what you do. Confident, that's a great closing line. Thank you very much, everybody, and we adjourn the session. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, one more round of applause. Thank you, Chris Swift, for traveling from Hartford, Connecticut, to be with us. And thank you for leading in this important issue. Deanna Lights, always a pleasure having you as a moderator. Hans Werner Koss, always a pleasure having you presiding. Thank you to both of you. Uh, remember, next Thursday, we're going to throw some axes at each other. So I hope to see you then. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for coming today.